briefly speaking, it's just a way to extend the set because like we said at the beginning, you need high effort. And um, it's a way to train with not the heaviest loads. I prefer to use loads where you could get at least eight reps and up to maybe 15, 20 at the most. I, I would tend to stick to the eight to 15 rep range with uh, my reps. And as you get into that proximity to where you're applying high effort, you're also activating a lot of muscle mass at the same time, simply due to how our neurology and physiology works. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. I am very excited about today's guest. This is a podcast that is long overdue. I've been meaning to have this person on for many years at this point. Um, let me give you a brief background, sort of a, an official background about him. And then I want to tell a, a bit of a personal uh, story about my background with him. His name is Borg Fagerly, and he spent more than 25 years as a coach in the fitness and health industry and is known for his innovative approaches to nutrition, training, mindset, and lifestyle optimization. He's the creator of the training method Myo Reps and a highly efficient way to build muscle and strength while spending less time in the gym. And his work is characterized by a, com a combination of evidence-based practices and holistic perspectives, a passion for innovation and deep thinking, and a dedication to helping individuals achieve their highest potential in body and mind. Now, I have some personal history with Borg that is, uh, is really interesting and something that I'm that I, I, every time I think about, I, I, I remember how grateful I am for it. So um, more than a decade ago, or about a decade ago, I published my first book that I, that I wrote called Forever Fat Loss. And Borg read this book. Obviously, I, I didn't know him personally at that time. Uh, he read this book, and then he went to my website to purchase a program from me, a program that I was selling at the time called the Metabolism Supercharge Program, which was my latest thinking about nutrition and, uh, and included a whole bunch of uh, information on nutrition as it ties into the circadian rhythm. And at that time, the research was pretty limited uh, as far as what we knew on that topic. And that specific topic of the interface of nutrition and circadian rhythm also happened to be uh, an interest of Borg's at the time. So he was spending time looking into that same subject. He did my program and, and then I got an email from him uh, maybe a few days after he purchased, basically saying, you know, I'd like a refund and I think you're wrong about this, 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 and this. You know, I think, you know, I, I bought this program and I, I was hoping to learn more, but I'm pretty sure you're wrong about your thoughts on, you know, this aspect of nutrition and circadian rhythm. And at the time I was very new into business. And so I was personally, I was a solopreneur. I was, I didn't have a customer support team working for me. So I was personally seeing emails requesting a, a refund. And I saw this one from Borg and, you know, he's saying, Hey, I'm, I'm an expert in this topic and I know this research inside and out. And so I said, you know, I'm happy to issue you a refund, but can I, can I ask you, can we engage in conversation? I would love to learn from you if I'm, if I'm wrong about something, can we discuss this? And that little conversation that started with him asking for a refund on my program that he had purchased turned into this beautiful discussion uh, and debate that, that he and I had for, I think, probably weeks, if not months after that. Mm -hmm. And he and I would go back and forth trying to figure it out. And, and we engaged in real, a real dialectic where we were both open to learning from each other and trying to arrive at truth together and figure things out together. And, you know, this study says this and this one seems to contradict that one. And um, and we formed a friendship out of it. He ended up coming to Florida for a period of time and stayed with me. And then we ended up building out a whole bunch of content on nutrition and circadian rhythm. Uh, and other aspects of, of lifestyle uh, that ended up being actually sort of the origins of the brand that I built, the, the Energy Blueprint. 
Um, so I've always had a lot of gratitude in my heart for you, Borg, for that initial, for emailing me, asking for a refund, and then what turned into this, this great conversation where both you and I, I think, learned a lot from it and became uh, good friends in the process. So with all of that said, uh, it's a pleasure to now finally, more, a, a decade later, to now be interviewing you on my podcast. Yeah, thank you for that uh, introduction, and it's it's quite an interesting backstory there. Um, yeah. This is a good thing to be reminded of, and probably the best um, response I've ever received to a refund re request. So <laughs> <laughs> it just goes to show that you're a stand-up guy and, and really uh, have the scientific integrity that's sorely lacking you know, amongst your peers. Yeah, yeah, likewise. Well, the feeling is so mutual, and... Um... You know, we've gone our, our separate ways since then, and, and I've I focus more on energy and you focus more on the fitness side of things. And and you've gone very deep in this and you're one of the most respected experts out there, especially you're very well known in Europe, but also known to, uh, you know, people in the in the US fitness scene. Um, and you're known as the creator of Myo reps, this unique methodology of training. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that's the best place to start, but maybe um, I, I know we will get into that. Maybe tell people about sort of your your background in fitness and how you got into bodybuilding and a, and a focus on body composition. Yeah, well, I guess uh, it's the same uh, same uh, foundation story that many in the, in the business have. That you know, small and weak, lacked self confidence and. You know, found my passion in lifting weights and being able to transform my body, and um, also obviously a profound change in my mindset. So, um, just uh, um, just the fact that you can go into a gym and see something progress that you can actually measure and and see the numbers go up was. You know, I'm I'm like a, a big nerd by heart and anything that can be measured and that I can just dig my fingers into and, and try to figure out and adjust uh, the levers and, and see things moving in the right or the wrong direction. That just kind of made me stick to this. And mm -hmm. being an engineer by education, um, I obviously didn't pursue that for very long. Uh, I didn't want to work with machines. I wanted to work with the human body. And um, just working with the individuals that, um, you know, I, I would figure out certain things that would work in myself. And they either worked way better in my clients or they didn't work at all. And those that it didn't work... Uh, I had to kind of figure out how to make things work. And I, I guess I, I always learn more from the ones that I, I couldn't figure out things than I learned from the ones that everything just ran smoothly. And I guess that's just kind of the, the way life works, that you need to solve problems in order to evolve and grow. So that that kept me in the business for probably too long. Um I, I tend to get very obsessive and OCD about things and, and minor details sometimes. So one of my challenges has been to um, be able to zoom out and look at the bigger picture. And when I do, um, I'm able to see more context and nuance and try to fit the pieces together. So it's it's like a big puzzle to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think you know I've I've followed your work for many years. I've read a lot of your your posts on social media, and I I love your your commentary, your sort of meta level perspective about you know how we are thinking about this process of muscle building and strength development, um, and also your critiques of a lot of what goes on in that um, in that domain in that sphere of of you know sort of evidence based fitness circles. Um, and I want to get into that with you. I want to get into how you think about things. And I want to get into sort of some of the problems that you see in those evidence-based fitness circles about how people think about this. Um, now, I want you to understand, however, that um, my audience is a bit different from the typical sort of evidence-based fitness circle audiences. 
where, you know, my audience is not a bunch of fitness freaks necessarily who are bodybuilders or aspiring bodybuilders or physique competitors who are already really deep, you know, indoctrinated into this world and understand all the different um, competing sort of uh, training methodologies and, and, and um, philosophies of training and all that kind of stuff. So um, with that in mind, can you give people kind of uh, a broad overview of that landscape as you see it and kind of the, the different ideas that are out there that are prominent and maybe where you land on that spectrum as far as your, your philosophy uh, um, or methodologies of training? Wow, that's, that's a really good question. Um, and I'm a big fan of zooming out because I think the problem with the um the the fitness industry as as it were is uh they're way too zoomed in on the details hung up on details and kind of arguing back and forth about minor nuances that probably don't really matter all that much on, on an individual level so um to to me it can be very simple you can make it very complex but uh, I, th I think it's unneeded complexity that just tends to be popular because it's the only way to to get attention these days mm -hmm. and that's i guess don't don't hate to play the game you know it's it's the social media and it's uh so many people trying to make a name for themselves and there's a lot of finger pointing and projection biases and and just generally arguing about things that don't help to elevate our common knowledge about how to change or for the better. Yeah, there's this kind of incentive, financial incentive to differentiate oneself. If you're if you're a fitness influencer, and this exists, mm -hmm. you know, in many domains, not just not just fitness, but in wellness more broadly, and lots of other spheres, and business, and finance, and all every every niche you can think of. But yeah. you have this financial incentive for pe people to try to say different things to come up with a different angle so that they can get attention so that they can get more virality more people paying attention to them so that ultimately they can make more money so there's this yeah. financial incentive that is pushing people in the direction of looking for differentiating factors which almost in it, it incentivizes for people to come up with different um approaches let's say in the fitness domain mm -hmm. like somebody's interested in muscle building how do i compete with this these other hundred guys who are teaching people about muscle building well i got to come up with a different angle i got to say why their their way of doing things is wrong and why my yeah. way is better and my way is right and when you have a whole landscape of so many people playing that game the end consumer of all of this information is left with a distorted uh, perspective of how much those details, those differences that all these influencers are arguing about, how much those differences actually matter. Yeah, that's just spot on. And um, it's, it's, I don't think they even realize how much this confuses their followers. Because it seems like they're disagreeing on 90% when they probably agree on 90% and only disagree, maybe not on 10 percent perhaps even just five percent mm -hmm. so it yeah. it just you know we we all deep down want to just help people improve their bodies and minds and life that's at least for me my if if i really want to shout and just step step away from it all and and reflect on my, am i still involved in this that's my primary purpose mm -hmm. and and looking at the industry now and, and all of the finger pointing and shouting and, and name calling we're not doing that anymore so mm -hmm. it's, i i just feel like at this point um like I, I keep saying that the picture has been the same for probably the last two to three decades and we're only getting more details in the picture but we haven't changed the picture mm -hmm. but it to, to people that are just um, 
trying to learn about this, it seems like we're all talking about different pictures. So, yeah. so that's why I try to be kind of a voice of reason and more like, hey, you know, guys, the, these are the fundamentals. We need to zoom out, look at this long term. And I mean, remember that you're only going to grow a muscle as big as your genes and hormones determine. That's your, your upper ceiling. So how quickly you get there doesn't really matter if you plan to train for, let's hope, the, the next decade or two or three. I plan to train for the next three decades and I'm 50. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, whether it takes you three, five or eight or maybe 10 years to get there doesn't really matter at that point. So, so let, let's kind of just try to zoom out and, and offer advice that people can actually use in the gym because yeah. it's, I, I, I keep using the analogy of getting a suntan because I think it's a good uh, metaphor for, uh, you know, stimulus and adaptation, physiological adaptation. You apply sunlight and then you, you know, stay in the shadow until the skin has had time to adapt. And it's the same thing with, with a muscle. You stress it, stimulate it, apply some duration and intensity of a load instead of light. And, and that muscle will respond by growing bigger and stronger. Now, what people are kind of arguing about is what is the optimal way to get a suntan without defining your skin color, your sensitivity to sunlight, your geographical location, how much cloud cover there is. You know, so so they're all, they're all kind of arguing about, well, you should be just spending as much time in the sun as possible with as, as strong sunlight as possible. That's essentially what what they're pointing in in the direction of. Yeah, and I just you know, obviously that's that's a very flawed way to advise on how to get a suntan. Yeah, because you need that's to look a, that's at the a person in front of you and, and consider their their skin skin tone and sensitivity to sunlight. Yeah, that's a great analogy to explain it. And uh, I'm sitting here in Costa Rica and you're over there in Norway. And, <laughs> right. uh, and I think you have snow in the background behind you in the window yeah. there. Is that snow outside oh. you in the house across the street? Still snow. Yeah. 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 Mm. So, you know, there you go. The, <laughs> if you take, if, if you traveled here to Costa Rica and got uh, sunlight and went surfing for me, I'm hoping to maybe go for a surf session right after this podcast. I have some right. good conditions right now for it. But if you went surfing with me in the middle of the day here in Costa Rica, it, it's a good bet that your skin's probably not going <laughs> to be conditioned for it. Um, exactly. And, you know, there are some people whose ancestry, they can't even be con conditioned for it, right? right. So um, with that said, let's, let's go into this 90% that you're referring to, the, the fundamentals. So given that my audience is not, you know, maybe some people are, but n most of them are not going to be well-versed in knowing all the different training methodologies that exist in these fitness circles. Hmm. Let's say you're taking people through this, okay? So you have a person sitting in front of you and they don't have any real knowledge other beyond, let's say, they, they, they obviously have some awareness that exercise is healthy. Like exercise is good for them. I should exercise because exercise is healthy. I know that I'm supposed to maybe do some cardio because that's good for my heart. And, um, and I know that I'm also supposed to lift weights because that's good for keeping my muscles strong. Uh, but beyond that, I don't really know anything about how I should approach weightlifting, how often I should do it, how intense, what are the training parameters, how many sets and reps and what types of exercises I should do and how frequently and how much rest I should have in between. And, or maybe it's the type of person who is doing some weight training, but they're going to the gym for, you know, they, they do half an hour sessions a few times a week. And every time they go, they do the same routine and they're still, after five years of doing it, they're still lifting the 12 pound dumbbells for the same three sets of 10 reps that they were doing five years ago. Right. Yeah. So, um, if you have a person like that in front of you and you have, let's say, let's say the next 30 minutes to teach them 
here are the most essential fundamentals you you will need to be successful in training. Hmm. Where do you start? Wow. Um, and I again, I know you're used to having more advanced conversations about all the details and the nuances and the the debate. So like now I'm asking you to to just describe the fundamentals, right? Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's good. I mean, I have a lot of uh, newbies that just want to, you know, again, a voice of reason. What, what, where do I start? What do I do? And I, I guess if, if we start with strength and muscle growth, because they're really closely intertwined, uh, closer than most tend to think, uh, you can obviously train for strength uh, separate from muscle growth, but you know, the biggest powerlifters are also the strongest. Uh, so, and the strongest are the biggest. So there's a, there's a correlation there, but I think we all need to uh, start by uh, talking within the context of effort. So I think it's really hard to get anything to happen unless you apply effort. So in, instead of going to the gym and doing hour long workouts, I teach people to, you know, spend a couple of sets of warm ups to practice technique if you want to, but you, you need to at least start with one hard set. And that's as good starting point as any for, for most, even more advanced. And I would even say those who have been training for five to 10 years and are still doing the same thing, you probably, you, you are probably not applying effort. If you are, you're applying effort over too many sets, too long workouts. So scale it all back and just do one hard set. And I think for most, uh, three workouts per week is a very good compromise and even optimal for most because we need to consider their overall lifestyle and stress because the stress from lifting weights also... Um, should be summarized with your overall life stress. So if you have a lot of life stress, then you should probably not even spend three days in, in lifting weights. But I think three days is, is a very good template to start with for most. It's also highly probable that you can train the full body in each workout. At some point, this will become more difficult to recover from, but it's, it's also a very good starting template. Now, instead of thinking of the body as having, you know, hundreds of muscles and you need to do one exercise for each, you, you can mostly use compound lifts that train a lot of muscle per exercise and do five, maybe six different exercises in the workout. And, and just explain what that means for people who are unfamiliar with that term, compound lifts. Yeah, so a compound lift is something that involves the muscles in each direction of movement for the upper and lower body. So for the upper body, we have horizontal pushing and pulling. That will be like a chest press or bench press and a row. And we have a vertical pulling and pushing, which would be a shoulder press and a pull down or a pull up, if you're strong enough for that. And for the legs, we have what we just define as knee dominant, which would be like a squat or a lunge or split squat. And a hip dominant, which would be something that moves the hips, but not the knees. So like um, a back extension or a deadlift type movement. Mm -hmm. so, so those six movements will generally hit most of the muscle mass and be a very good starting point, depending on you know, biomechanics and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, get a personal trainer to help you look at your technique. And many people tend to think that you should only do free weight movements, like very unstable movements, because that builds more functional strength. To me, I'm not so sure that that's true. Um, if you want to get a big deadlift, you always need to deadlift. But if you just want to get the muscle stronger, then you might as well do some type of machine exercise or something that's more stable because it allows you to actually train the muscle instead of learning to coordinate. So you will get more rapid gains if you pick like machine exercises that are more stable 
uh, but free to use the warm ups for you know training movements like coordination. That's that, that's perfectly fine. But uh, not everyone should be loading squats or deadlifts or bench presses heavy. There are way too many injuries worldwide every year due to lifting too heavy and not having the biomechanics for that. But you know that either the way, two to three warm ups and one hard set. Where you don't really need to go to absolute failure, where you know, let's define it as technical failure, where your technique breaks down when you start to cheat or use your body in a way that it's not supposed to be moving under heavy loading. Um, but you 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 might stop like rep from failure. And this is important because many people are too afraid of lifting or pushing themselves in the gym and or actually. Uh, have like more than five reps in reserve if you actually push them. I've, I've spent many years in the gym training people one on one, and and even people with five plus years of training experience. Um, when they say, "Yeah, I'm done now. I only have one more rep in me," and and you motivate them and you push them, and other clients do ten more reps. <laughs> so so in that case, if you're only doing warm up training in the gym i define that as a warm-up set not a not a true hard set then you're not going to get any gains so so let's start there with one hard set and and that i feel like it's it's worth digging into that point of differentiation a bit more because i think only people who have been training for several years at a relatively high intensity will really get what you're talking about there. Like there, mm -hmm. there's a difference between sort of having a weight and doing your set of 10 reps versus having a weight and doing a set where you are really getting to or very close to true muscular failure. Right. Mm -hmm. And so what, what you're talking about is intensity and effort as you're describing it, um, where you're, you're alluding to the idea that the, the magic of sort of stimulating these adaptations and strength and muscle building really relate very strongly to being able to exert an intensity of effort that's very close to your maximal intensity of effort um, for those repetitions, getting close to true muscular failure. Is that accurate to say? Yeah, that's just what I'm trying to say here. And uh, I would also say that most should probably be spending more time in the five to 10 rep range. Um, if you do way more reps than that, your perception of effort will be higher than the actual stimulus simply because it's hard on the cardiovascular system. It's burning and uncomfortable. So most tend to hold back unless they're very experienced. And at the other end of the scale, if you're lifting loads that are heavier than your five rep max, People tend to be scared of that and maybe not willing, or maybe they shouldn't even push really hard on like their one, two or three rep max, unless it's a very safe machine isolation movement. So I, I tend to think like the five to 10 rep range is, is a very good sweet spot for most to actually learn how to uh, apply effort to, to their lifting. And many will just get some amazing gains for the next two to three, maybe up to six months with just one hard set. Mm -hmm. So this is an important thing, I think, for women, especially in my experience. And, and I, I spent many years as a personal trainer in my in my 20s. So I have a lot of experience training women where I see that almost no women who mm. are not like fitness fanatics, who are not um, who, who haven't spent time with a personal trainer or really studying this field, almost without exception, none of them work in the five to 10 rep range. They, they yeah. almost all will work 12 reps to 25 reps or 12 to 30 or 50 reps in their sets. Yeah. Um, and what you said a minute ago, I think is really important for, for women to hear, especially, and also maybe a lot of men as well. But um, I think your phrasing was that when you choose a rep range that's much higher than five to 10, 
Mm -hmm. the, I think you said the perception of the effort will be higher than the actual stimulus on the muscle tissue to, to create an effect, to create an adaptation. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, you can build muscle. I mean, we have research showing that all the way up to 30 reps, you can build muscle. But in these studies, they're usually employing like a leg extension and they're highly motivated subjects and the researchers are pushing them really hard. So they're actually able to train to their 30 rep max. But what we also see is that this creates a lot of muscle damage and soreness. And um, it's, it's generally just harder to recover from. And, and again, most people can't on their own volition train to that point. Um, I think the reason most are drawn to the higher rep ranges is because their perception of actually training, like their su subjective perception of training a muscle is higher, but all they're actually sensing there is burning from you know lactate production and metabolic stress. And the metabolic stress can uh, absolutely enhance the stimulus at a lighter load. So it helps us to load the muscle at those loads. But uh, they also kind of prevent you from actually training the muscle effectively. And like I said, the fatigue from that type of training tends to require more recovery. So... Um, since, since most people are also drawn to this because they they get more fatigued, they get more exhausted, and they think in their mind that this is going to burn more calories and burn more fat. Now, the difference in, in calorie burning is, is minimal because you're only burning as you're lifting the weight. And when you have to rest between the sets to catch your breath, you're not actually burning more calories, you know. The after effect, the epoch, as we call it, is 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 uh, smaller than we thought. Mm -hmm. So don't use the gym for burning fat. Use the gym for getting stronger and building muscle, and use the diet or activity in general to to get the fat off. That's that's my recommendation. So yeah. so doing higher reps is actually just preventing you from applying a proper stimulus fatigue doesn't cause the muscle growth. It's the unavoidable side effect of lifting weights to stimulate muscle growth. So it goes along with the stimulus, but the fatigue is something you need to recover from. So the more fatigue you create, the more recovery you require to actually be able to stimulate the muscle to grow again. Mm -hmm. So we kind of need to figure out what, what is called the best stimulus to fatigue ratio. Yeah. More stimulus, less fatigue. And, and that's why I think five to 10 reps is a better sweet spot. Right. Um, what would you say to a woman listening to this who has been working? You know, she's, she's been doing some training in the gym with weights because she knows it's good for her. Mm -hmm. But really kind of staying in the low weights um, and higher rep ranges, like 15 to 20, 15 to 30 sort of rep ranges with the same weights without really moving to, to heavier weights, even after several years of training, and who feels intimidated to try to work in the way you're describing in the five to 10 range, rep range, which means heavier weights, and mm -hmm. using five to 10 rep range you know, where you are getting close to muscular failure, which again means I have to actually use heavier weights and arrive, you know, each rep is going to be much more strained, much more intense, and I'm going to arrive at the point of muscular failure much more quickly. And I'm, and I've got to get used to sort of, it's a different sensation to really use a heavy weight that challenges you after only five or six or seven reps compared to using, you know, let's say the proverbial 10 pound dumbbells for for 25 reps of bicep curls where you don't even really feel them to be heavy until you get to rep 15 or 20 right it's mm. it's it's kind of a different sensation that you have to get used to so if if a woman listening to this feels intimidated to start shifting her rep ranges lower and using heavier weights what or has the typical thing of being afraid that they're going to build too much muscle which is common yeah. among uh, women that they're afraid to get big and bulky. 
what what would you say to a woman who's um, sort of thinking that way? Yeah, well, it's, it's the same as if you invited me to Costa Rica now. I, I obviously couldn't stay out surfing with you uh, mm -hmm. the first day. I, I would have to build gradually up to it. Mm -hmm. So start with where you are now and just begin adding loads. Because, I mean, you know, many people have thought for years that progressive overload is what causes their muscles to grow. But it's, it's kind of the opposite. It's like a chicken or egg paradox. Mm. Your ability to lift heavier loads or the same load for more reps means that the stimulus to fatigue ratio is good. It means that you're applying a stimulus and you're recovering from it and you're growing, getting stronger. So um, first, you, you might even try to just add more load and see if you get can get the same reps. That would be like the first order of business. So if you're doing 15 rep sets now, try adding load and see if you can hit 15. If you can hit, hit 12, then that's fine. Maybe stay with that load until you hit 15 again. You don't need to jump straight to 10 reps or your five rep max. Now, over the next few weeks or even months, you can gradually and slowly progress down to the 10, 10 rep range and then maybe eight reps. And then you can start swishing it up and doing, you know, like one set of eight reps and one set of 10 to 15. That's that's also a good way to, to do things. I, I, you know, we have even have good research showing that um, if, if you enjoy your training, the rep ranges you're doing, the exercises you're doing, you will get better progress than if someone tells you what to do. Mm -hmm. So if you like training with higher reps, then do higher reps. If you like leg presses instead of squats or vice versa, then do what exercise you enjoy doing. Try to expand your comfort zone by doing things you're not used to and see, and perhaps you will begin to enjoy that better and get better progress. It's usually tied to better progress. Um, but but don't feel like you have to absolutely do something. If you're stuck at the same place, not getting any progress, then you need to do something different. That's basically what I'm trying to get at here. Mm -hmm. And what would you say to the woman who's afraid of uh, lifting weights or lifting heavy because she doesn't want to get big and bulky? Yeah, I, I mean, I work with uh, like 16-year-olds, boys with raging testosterone levels uh gulping protein shakes and creatine and it it still takes years to build muscle <laughs> so it's not as if you're gonna suddenly wake up and i I, I was that 16 year old boy who was, who was yeah, and i'm too. sure you were too yeah, yeah. trying <laughs> that's that's why it's funny for us like given that it experience is. of being you know in our teens and our 20s dying to gain muscle and killing ourselves mm. in the gym and consuming way more food and protein than we should be and still yeah. experiencing how hard it is to gain muscle. And so when we see like a, 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 a woman who is afraid of turning into Arnold Schwarzenegger by using <laughs> 15 pound dumbbells instead of 10 pound dumbbells, you know, it, it becomes this kind of this interesting thing where you have to spend time like, no, trust me, you're, you're, you're not going to, you're not going to become too big and bulky trust too fast. I, I wish I had that problem. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, most of us wish we had a problem that's, yeah. you know, it would kind of kill most 99% of debates. If it was that easy, you know, yeah. we wouldn't be arguing about this stuff. If it was, if it was that easy, but I mean, maybe they're scared because they've seen some really muscular woman online or like a fitness influencer. But you need to keep in mind that th this is like probably a decade, maybe, maybe two of really hard training and dedication to their nutrition. And they're not just doing three full body workouts. They're probably doing some type of splits with five to six days in the gym, tons of cardio, and even let's face it, some pharmaceutical assistance. Yeah. Yeah. I, I will say in all my years of training, I have only seen one woman. Uh, it was when I was when I was a trainer, I was training one college athlete. And she was of, I think she was of like Polynesian ancestry, maybe half or, or full. And she was just built like a tank. 
and she had yeah. like tree trunks for legs and you could it was almost like you could watch her muscles grow in real time you know a few months of training and her legs would get like three inches bigger and yeah. i mean i wish i grew muscle as easily as this 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 woman did and um so I, I think it exists rarely there are certain genetic freaks out there who can grow muscle really easily with some weightlifting, but it seems to be extraordinarily rare yeah and i mean yeah i've had female clients that are uh, i mean I, I would even say that the most dramatic physique transformation is gained from losing body fat mm -hmm. not necessarily building a lot of muscle but just uh getting the 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 fat layer over the muscle to to shrink so that the muscle underneath is more visible yeah. i've even had like you know, many female clients that are uh, competing in fitness and they lost maybe 20 pounds of weight from their like off season shape and, and getting into uh contest condition and and covered up in clothes they, they looked really tiny but when they take their clothes off they they look like you know, really huge and muscular, but I mean, they're weighing like a hundred pounds on stage. Wow. So, so it just looks like it's a lot of muscle. I mean, I, I even had the same transformation myself. I, I, I had the same body weight, but you know, I just lost a lot of body fat and obviously built some muscle in the process as well. But I mean, I'm, I'm probably 20 pounds lighter now than when I used to do bodybuilding and, you know, use steroids and all kinds of stuff. So it just looked like I was huge, but in, in person, I'm, I'm really not. So mm -hmm. it's a visual illusion, basically. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so, so effort and rep ranges are some of the fundamentals that we've covered so, so far. What, what else uh, would you put in this category of fundamentals that people need to know to train effectively? I would say the, the most underestimated aspect is actually resting between sets, resting between sets and resting between workouts. Uh, the more ambitious and, and uh, motivated you are, you're probably not resting long enough between sets. I would say you not only need to catch your breath, but you actually need to see that you can perform just as well or sometimes even better in the next set. So for most, I will be like two to three minutes between sets. Mm -hmm. And if you just bring out the stopwatch, many are, you know, they feel like they're getting effective workouts and only resting 30 to 60 seconds between sets. That's fatigue, you know, that's perception of effort, but you're not actually stimulating the muscle appropriately because you're accumulating so much fatigue that the fatigue is preventing you from actually stimulating the muscle to grow. Mm -hmm. So two to three minutes of rest between working sets especially if you're doing more working sets for the same muscle is is uh, a very critical i mean we have lots of studies showing that shorter rest periods limits muscle growth and you can you know uh you can double the rest period and double the the gains uh, wow. essentially so so yeah resting long enough between sets and then also resting long enough between workouts because like i said uh, when you stimulate the muscle to grow, you also accumulate fatigue doing long workouts with not only the warm up sets, but the hard working sets, uh, using a lot of muscle in the, comp like the big lifts, uh, you should probably try to, uh, strive for having one day of rest or a low intensity activity in between. So if you have a week full of like interval training and sports and just general high intensity everything, and you're doing strength or, or bodybuilding on top of that, then you might not be recovered to actually get results from the training. Yeah, so, I, so I'm kind of in Having that. rest days in between there is, is a good idea. Yeah, I, I'm a bit in that category myself these days. Um, I can't tolerate nearly as much heavy training and training to failure as I used to because mm -hmm. I'm surfing and playing tennis and doing jujitsu, uh, yeah. all of which can be like very high intensity cardio. So I'm getting a lot of exercise. Sometimes I'm between surfing and tennis and weight training. I can, I, I, I'm doing four or five hours of exercise in a given day. 
um, at pretty high intensity. In some cases, the, the waves here in Costa Rica can be big and paddling out can be exhausting and sometimes also scary. You get adrenaline dumps if the waves are really big. Um, yeah. Tennis is certainly, a, it can be a killer cardio workout if you're playing against a, a hard opponent. Um, oh, yeah. And I, I've noticed that if I push myself training in the gym the way that I used to before I did tennis or when I wasn't surfing so frequently, uh, I, I get, I, my body gets burnt out. And I, mm. if I do too many sets at too high of an intensity training to failure with heavy weights. So I, I've really learned that I have to kind of back off that volume yeah. and back off the, the, the effort, kind of the opposite scenario of the some opposite. of the other people we were talking about earlier, where I have to not do as many sets training to failure, uh, in order for me to not create too much fatigue on the system. Yeah. I mean, then that's again, uh, trying to, to look at on an individual basis, where are you on the spectrum? So if you're already used to pushing with a high degree of effort, pushing to failure, and you're adding volume on top of that, I, I, I think we should first define proximity to failure before we even start discussing volume. So if you want to add volume, you should stay further from failure. Mm -hmm. That's probably the only way you can recover from it because now you're adding, since going to failure dramatically increases the fatigue, like the final one or two reps dramatically increases the fatigue compared to the reps before that. Even though you get more stimulus, it's a trade-off that might not be worth it if you're also adding volume to that and you have a lot of high intensity training. So definitely for you and for others listening to this that are similar to that, I would recommend scaling back the effort and, and also the volume for a while. I, I have to admit, and I feel a little, a little bit like a dummy because of this, because I've been <laughs> learning exercise, studying exercise science, teaching exercise science since I was a teenager, you know, really starting at age 13. So this is almost three decades now for me. Hmm. And it's taken me to my very late thirties to realize what you just described, you know, <laughs> like to, to, yeah, yeah. to really <laughs> understand that I needed that, that, that this, I can train smarter and not be fatigued all the time. If I just stop taking every set to failure and stop pushing that hard on every single set, because I used to be of the mentality that like the, the set in the gym didn't count or wouldn't have an effect if right. I didn't yeah. take it all the way to failure. And right. so I, I just became for training so long, I became used to taking everything to failure and doing a high volume to failure. And it took me so long to figure out that if I just back off, I can still do the volume, I can still have a high intensity, but if I just don't push all the way into muscular, complete muscular failure on every set, yep. that I can still create, I can still have a great physique, I can still um, train hard and, and have uh, a great training effect, but without so much fatigue from the exercise. Yeah, I mean, that's just it. I mean, um, I've even seen clients that are training to absolute failure just do one rep in reserve and go from regression like stagnation and even regression to progress yeah just from that saving that single rep yeah on each set. yeah so, that's so exactly it can be a game changer exactly the realization i have and it, and it was a game changer for me for sure yeah so let's get into some other fundamentals in terms of and you've alluded to some of these components but how often should somebody be training and um, how long should each training be and how much volume per muscle group? Right. Um, I, I think from not only the research, but my experience, and that's like almost three decades now, um, I can say that if, if you're staying at lower volumes you can probably train each muscle group three times per week like every other day and even more frequent but that tends to require that you, you don't train to failure uh, like if you're doing powerlifting or weightlifting then you're doing submaximal training and, and staying more reps to serve and, and 
now we can practice to lift more often, basically. But I would say a sweet spot is probably training each muscle group every three to five days, like twice a week on average. That That's a good, uh, like the next step in your progression. So if you've been training one set, two or close to failure uh, on compound lifts, full body training three times per week after four to six plus months, it's probably a good idea to start switching it up and training like upper body in one session, lower body in the next, or some some type of split um, is, is a good idea. At that What's your favorite body part split? Mine is um, at the moment either upper lower or I have like this hybrid type split now, which is push pull legs three days in a row. And then a day of rest, and then I do upper body and lower body. So it's five days of training. It just fits my schedule perfectly. Okay, Expl that's... explain to people what push pull legs means. That's like all pressing for the upper body, so vertical and horizontal pressing for shoulders and chests and triceps, and the pulling would be like the back muscles and biceps, and legs is legs, you know, everything downstairs. <laughs> so you have three distinct training days per week, and then you try to you try to rotate. So you're training each of those days, each of those muscle groups, roughly two days every seven or eight days, somewhere around there. Yeah, yeah. So it's five training days. So mm -hmm. three days on the push pull legs, one day of rest, upper, lower, one day of rest. So that allows me to train each muscle group twice per week. Mm -hmm. So the second session, like the upper training session, I can have different rep ranges, uh, less sets. I can focus more on some muscle groups than others. But I mean, I'm, I've been lifting weights for 30 years, so I'm at a point where I'm beginning to refine things. So most aren't close to that point and, and can you know, just do a regular all upper lower split, depending on uh, what they want to focus on. What about exercise consistency versus exercise variety in terms of the, the specific types of exercise that one doing I, uh, that one is doing? I know that uh, there's been debate among some gurus. Some people say, you know, stick with the same exercise for months and focus on just increasing the load and then you know there's these other ideas in part popularized like it's some pseudoscience -y stuff that's just been marketing gimmicks like um hmm. uh i forget the effect but like i think p90x popularized uh, the, uh i think the term muscle confusion right the idea that yeah. if you do mm -hmm. different exercises every time you work out you confuse the muscles which creates a superior effect but then you have this <laughs> kind of this this play between are you actually doing progressive overload or not if you're constantly rotating the to a different exercise you don't have the consistency to know are you actually increasing the load mm -hmm. whereas there's the Good other point. side of it whereas if you stay with the same exercise always then you maybe are lacking different kinds of stimulus on the muscle and you're limited by that factor. And so the muscle sort of becomes accustomed to that particular exercise and it loses its stimulus. So what, how do you see the balance between those variables? Yeah, great question. Um, muscle confusion to me means that the person is confused. <laughs> so it's, uh, you can't confuse a muscle. It's, it's like a piece of meat it just responds to electrical signals. Mm -hmm. uh, the brain can be confused, however, and that's, <laughs> you know, what, what sends the electrical impulses. Uh, so what happens is if you constantly change exercises, at least if it's a very complex technical exercise, is that it takes a while to relearn or learn that movement before you can appropriately stimulate the muscle. So, so that's kind of a waste of time to me. Uh, if you're doing more stable isolation type movements or machine type movements, then you can certainly switch without actually needing to relearn. Like there's there's a lower coordination demand, so you you can easily or or readily stimulate that 
muscle involved in movement uh, without having to go through some weeks of neural learning to to achieve that um so i do think it's it's good to have a, a certain core type of list of exercises that you train consistently or variations thereof but you can freely rotate uh, vary your isolation movements and less technical movements and i would say the more advanced you get the more exercise variety you should probably have to properly and fully train each muscle group because you can look at the muscle as having different segments at least when you when you start looking at muscle groups so the back is like 10 to 12 different main muscle groups and and the legs is about the same i mean just the front of the leg responsible for extending your knee that's four different muscles the quadriceps, you know, quad, it's four muscles. So not all muscles are trained equally well with just one movement. So you need different like resistance curves and movement types to appropriately, appropriately trained, train them as you get beyond a certain level of development. Mm -hmm. So I, I tend to add complexity, meaning add more exercise variety, the more advanced you get. It's not really needed at the beginner level, but for psychological reasons, you know, some tend to get bored if they train the same thing over and over and over again. So, you know, for that reason alone, it's worth trying something different once in a while. If you're a novelty seeker, then for sure, that personality type probably needs more variety than those who are uh, you know more scared of change and, and want to stick to what's uh, what, what they are used to, right? And and that's another variable to add to that mix, right? Is that our brains become bored with what's routine, and so mm -hmm. adding novelty kind of fa factors into motivation to work out and to push yourself hard, and so like mm -hmm. you 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 need you if you always have the same routines every time you go to the gym it can be demotivating for the brain or vice versa. If you have some novelty of different, of new exercises, new challenges, new types of exercise routines or new body part splits, it can add some excitement uh, and motivation uh, at the, at the level of the brain to your workout. So you end up training harder and, and going to the gym more consistently and that sort of thing. Yeah, and again, working with clients one on one, you kind of need to gauge what type of client that is. You know, do they need a lot of variety to stay motivated, or are they scared of too many changes? You know, mm -hmm. so so that can vary across the spectrum. I, I try to not change just for the sake of changing, but because it can actually help the client to get better gains and um, for some they actually need to learn to stick to a certain routine for long enough for us to actually get information on whether the program is working or not because your progress is telling us whether the program is working or not talk to me about consistency so i i think this is you know, I think for you and I, it's like, you know, we've been doing this since we were kids. And so it's just, it's like brushing our teeth or taking a shower. It's just something you do every day or every, every week it's routine. It's, there's no question of whether you go to the gym and whether you do your workouts, you, you just do it, you know, it's a part mm -hmm. of you, but for a lot of people, it's not like that. For a lot of people, they, they don't like going to the gym. It's painful. It's uncomfortable. They don't have a positive association with it. It's not something they look forward to. It's more something that's okay. It's a burden. I know I I'm supposed to do exercise because it's good for me, but I don't really like it. Yeah. So, and, and with that said, given, given that we know that consistency is obviously vital to getting results. So how do you see this variable of consistency? Yeah. I mean, um, to, to even learn or evolve or grow anything we need just the right amount of challenge so if it's too demanding or challenging we'll stop doing it but if it's not challenging enough we also will stop doing it we'll get bored and it won't actually 
like we said at the beginning, you need some level of effort to actually make anything happen. So on an individual level, um, I emphasize consistency because what you can stick with is the best diet and training and whatever in life. Uh, you need to apply uh, something long enough for it to matter and instead of trying to chase, you know, a new shiny object uh, uh, syndrome, basically. And so you just have to ask yourself, if, if you're not enjoying what you're doing, how can you make it more enjoyable? Like just the right amount of challenge, because not everything should be easy, you know? but it shouldn't be excessively hard either. So again, I can sit here and say out loud that five to 10 reps is the best, but if you hate 10 reps or five reps, then do 15. And if you hate squats and deadlifts, then do something you enjoy. So find some enjoyment, push yourself, but without pushing you, yourself so hard and get getting so sore and you know, everything just being painful, that you stop doing it. So that's where every person needs to find their own, you know, sweet spot, I guess. Yeah. So one thing we talked about in passing earlier in this conversation is, you know, these kind of incentives uh, on the different fitness influencers to come up with their own unique uh, training methodologies and say th these other people are wrong and this is the right way. Um, and one of the, I think, the most contentious issues in that regard is uh, volume, training volume um, and training intensity to some extent, but which factors into this as well. But mm -hmm. uh, you, we have everything from, you know, when people are talking about the, the optimal number of reps or, or sets and reps, total volume um, per muscle group per week to get the most amount of growth, you know, we have everything from high intensity interval or not high intensity interval training, uh, hit training, high, high intensity training, sort of Mike Menser inspired, you know, one set per body part to, you know, the people who advocate 30 or 40 or 50 sets. I think there's some research that goes up to 40 or 50 <laughs> sets per muscle group uh, per week. And you have all these debates, as you well know, between different uh, fitness influencers who are arguing one way or the other. What do you see as like describe to people how you see that landscape of of that debate of the different uh, di uh, camps, training camps out there or ideologies that are out there and mm -hmm. where you land on that spectrum, which which direction uh, you think is the, the better way to go? Yeah, I mean, I, I had the researcher behind the 50 set study on my podcast last week. So I, I, I had some good closure on the topic because we, we got to dig into uh, the data and also the subjects. And uh, he has also been working as a personal trainer and really passionate about training. And they had, a, you know, spent decades of, uh, he had like 80 publications in, in the exercise science field. Um, I, th I think, again, zooming out that we first need to define proximity to failure first. And uh, as long as you're training hard enough, when, like what, excuse me, one rep to failure, because a lot of studies aren't really pushing the subjects hard or they're not used to being pushed. So they're uh, subconsciously staying far further from failure than they should. But if you're training to a certain proximity to failure, like hard enough, then we can say that one set already provides like 50% of the maximum gains. And that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. And then every subsequent set adds gradually less stimulus until you reach a point of diminishing returns where you can probably not recover from it. Where, where like that just, stimulus to fatigue ratio starts to have more too much net fatigue relative to the stimulus. Exactly. And, and that seems to be around four to six sets for a certain muscle group in a workout. You can, if you vary the exercise sufficiently. So let's say that you're for the chest, like the chest is a fan shaped muscle. 
So if you're doing like four sets of pushing downwards, like a decline press or a chest press where your arms are moving downwards, you can probably do four sets of that and then four sets of incline where your arms are pushing upwards and kind of stimulating a different segment of the muscle. But in general, around four to six sets is where we see a sharp drop off in uh, the amount of muscle growth that you're getting from each additional set. So for most, it's probably not worth doing that. Legs perhaps can tolerate slightly more from the research we have, but the upper, upper body is certainly not. Um, <clears throat> so I think that's more useful as a starting point versus the, the weekly sets because that's entirely determined by how quickly you on an individual level can recover from those sets that you're doing. And uh, that's very, uh, that's frequency is probably the most individual variable because we have, some of us have constraints on our recovery ability. So, you know, sleep, nutrition, overall mental stress, just going through a, a exam period or divorce or whatever will severely put a constraint or, on your ability to recover and probably prolong it by two to three more days. So how many stimuli you can get within a week will ultimately determine how many weekly sets you can do. So at the, the very top end of the range, you can do six sets three times per week and get 18 weekly sets. If you have more reps in reserve, like if you're not pushing yourself really hard, again, returning to the proximity to failure debate, then you can probably make up for that by doing more sets. But we can't at this point say that that's better because, you know, there is a fatigue cost to every set you're doing, even if you're not really pushing to failure. So <clears throat> let, let, I spent some time trying to consolidate the different training styles. And what we see is that some have a personality type where, like yourself, you know, you, you kind of, it's, it's, it's almost hard for you not to train to failure. Mm -hmm. So holding back is kind of hard for some people. They just thrive on and, and are motivated by pushing really close or hard or beyond to failure, be, beyond the point of failure. Mm -hmm. And for these, we should probably limit the volume and try to determine how long does it take you to recover from that. And uh, you have a Mike Menser type routine. But on the other side of the spectrum, you can see some have a repeatability, like they can do a set of 10 reps, swear that they're training really hard, but do another set and get 10 reps. And so for whatever reason, whether it's psychological or muscle fiber types or work capacity or recoverability or whatever, these people can probably also tolerate more volume per session and even per week. So, so those are some indicators we can use to determine that I use when I train clients to, to say whether they should have a lower volume and frequency or higher volume and higher frequency perhaps. But ultimately, if you can recover from that volume determined by whether you are able to progress next time you go into the gym and are you able to do another rep or allow a load the same number of reps? Then, yeah, now you have figured out what recoverability you have versus, you know, uh, the number of uh, sets you did for that muscle group and how hard you, you were training. So I would tend to think because we need to, we need to, have um sustainability in 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 comp in 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 the the larger perspective what can you do for the next few years if you max out on volume now remember if one set provided 50 percent of the stimulus and you need five more sets to get to close to 100 percent that that's a very poor return uh, on investment uh, for some it might be worth it but can you recover from that? And can you do that consistently for the next five to 10 years? Most can't.
So, right. And, that, and that's, that's part yeah. of what figures into this, which adding further complexity is if your goal was to generate the most amount of hypertrophy, the most amount of muscle growth in the next six weeks, mm -hmm. like let's say, which is kind of how a lot of these studies are designed, right? They're, yeah. they're trying to assess how can we create the, the most amount of muscle growth in the shortest time frame. If that was your goal, you might design your training in a way where you're doing a, the most amount of volume possible with the most amount of training sets that you can tolerate mm -hmm. to failure as possible. But as yeah. soon as you incorporate the longer term picture, like our goal is not just the next six weeks, but the next six months, the next year, the next several years. And how do we train in a way that is that will lead to sustainable improvements in strength and size and not leave us feeling exhausted all the time because we're overdoing volume and training to failure. Now that picture changes a little bit and maybe that training methodology that looked in that six week study to be the best training methodology for muscle growth doesn't necessarily extrapolate out to long-term sustainability. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's just the point I'm trying to make these days that I mean, you have highly motivated researchers and subjects in a study spanning six, eight, maybe 10 to 12 weeks at the most. But how repeatable is that? How sustainable is that? Very little. I mean, even Professor D'Souza that did the 52 set study said that, well, we just recently collected data from a study where we used 12 to 14 weekly sets and we have the same growth. Wow. As in our 52 set study. Yeah. So why, why do 52 sets when you can do 12 weeks, weekly sets or four? Weeks? And also a lot of studies are confounded by not accounting for swelling. Uh -huh. And I mean, even getting a sunburn, your skin will have inflammation and swelling. And a lot of these high volume, high effort studies short-term studies don't account for the inflammation so it's not actual muscle growth it's just like temporary swelling that tends to dissipate once you allow the subject some rest mm -hmm. so many of these um, studies they they can grow and i also posted a picture show, showing like 0 0.2 centimeters like two millimeters which is i don't know how much of uh, uh a fraction of an inch, but it's, it's absolutely it's very minuscule. small. It's like one sixteenth of an inch or something like that. Exactly. We need fine instruments to measure this muscle growth with these highly intensive volume protocols over the short term. And we can't extrapolate that into infinity. It doesn't happen. Yeah. So we're getting like a full sense of optimalism from short-term studies incentivized by you know we need the researchers need to have results to display to to defend their funding you know so me having worked with clients for almost 30 years five thousand clients at the last count i i see trends when i work with people for several months and years that are just so far off from the optimalism that everyone is screaming and shouting on social media about, and it's way less and it's way more sustainable. Yeah. Um, tell people about myo reps and what exactly that is, how that figures into this landscape of what we we're just talking about with reps and rep and sets and volume and how close to failure you should go and that sort of thing. Yeah, so briefly speaking, it's just a way to extend the sets because like we said at the beginning, you need high effort. And um, it's a way to train with not the heaviest loads. I prefer to use loads where you could get at least eight reps and up to maybe 15, 20 at the most. I, I would tend to stick to the eight to 15 rep range with uh, my reps. And as you get into that proximity to where you're applying high effort, you're also activating a lot of muscle mass at the same time, simply due to how our neurology and physiology works. And uh, it just made sense that instead of resting two to three minutes and then doing another 
steps to get to that level of effort? Where does that count? Why not just insert a short the rest and do another few reps? So it's essentially hard set, short period of rest where you put the weights down, another three to five reps, and then you repeat that sequence basically it. So instead of doing three to five traditional sets, we just do one wild set. And this is called a rest pause technique. What separates my reps from traditional rest pause is that rest pause emphasizes going to failure. And as we have hopefully learned by now is that going to failure has a high risk reward ratio and also a low return on investment uh, ratio. So the stimulus to fatigue ratio for that final rep is so poor that I recommend as default to stay one to two reps from failure throughout. If you're just getting to that sweet spot and staying there with this technique, you get a really high stimulus and manage fatigue instead of chasing it and emphasizing fatigue that many other training techniques do. So that's just to do, kind of describe a typical Meyer upset. It would be picking an exercise that you can safely do and put down the load without expending a lot of effort to pick it up, back up. Uh, maybe to uh, do a set of 10 reps, put the weight down, take three to five deep breaths, pick up the load, do another three to five reps, and repeat that process for maybe three to five minutes. Has. 10 plus four plus four plus four stop, something like that. Mm -hmm. And all that's the equivalent three to four traditional sets. And you spend 70% less, less time in the gym for the same effect. So it's, it's the same effect, but it's way more efficient because you do get a more stimulus in less time. Mm -hmm. So you're doing this one extended set where you have more, what, what you call or are uh, called in the literature. I don't know if it's your term or the, uh, the literature term, but effective reps, it's this reps that are close to failure, sort of where you have maximal muscle fiber recruitment. And therefore your, your, those reps are the ones that are creating the most stimulus on the muscle tissue to make adaptations. You're trying to prolong the number of reps in that range by doing this one extended set in this, in this, um, in this repetition range and that this is equivalent in terms of the, the effect that it has on the muscles as compared to three or four traditional sets. So it's like a time efficient way to get essentially the same effect. You know, it's the, uh, it's the businessman's approach, you know, yeah. so you, <laughs> you can get the same, the same in effect on the muscle in 20 minutes as compared to maybe 40 minutes. Yes, that's exactly it. Yeah. Okay, so to wrap up, let's say that there are people listening to this who uh, just don't have the level of familiarity with weight training and some of these different terms and, and you know, effort and intensity and reps in reserve and, you know, sets per week and, you know, weekly volume and rep ranges and all these kinds of things. Let's say it's just too much for some people to handle. And, um, and, and this, this conversation is a bit over their head. They're feeling frustrated, not understanding how to implement this information. Okay. So how can you, um, leave people with a simple blueprint of how to start going in the gym and how they should design a new weightlifting program or, or change their existing one. So what are the key things that they should focus on? And I know we've covered this all in passing, but can you just kind of put a neat little bow on it and just say simply, here's how often you should work out. Here's what you should be shooting for as far as the type of exercises and here's how much volume you should do. Right. So, um, make sure you properly work up. Uh, I would say two workouts in a week is a good place to start. If you can get three, that's a bonus, but two will get you very far. Now pick one movement for each movement plane. So pressing overhead, pulling, 
red seeing from you and pulling towards you and now also something where you like two exercises for the legs one for and one for the front so some type of squat movement or leg press and so like a back extension or maybe just a leg curl like machine lying machine or sitting machine where you just curl your legs a uh, couple of warm-up set, warm sets and one hard set apply a high effort and see if you can do more reps or higher load next time uh, have a long-term perspective on it. If you felt like the set you just did really hit the spot or you weren't, you weren't sure if you managed to train hard enough, then feel free to do another. But for most, you can get in and out of the gym in 30, maybe 40 minutes, including warm-ups, and have great gains for the next few months. That, that's basically all it takes. And also make sure to rest until you can breath and feel ready to go for the for the next class or, or set. So two to three minutes. So be like the overarching principles to start with. And uh, it's fine to use machines for all of this. You don't actually need to use very unstable free weight exercises if uh, all you're trying to do is get stronger and, and build muscle than machines and more stable are perfectly fine great is there if you were going to leave people with one piece of mindset advice what would it be uh, your ability to delay gratification will be your best that that's basically the secret to everything in life so trying to be aware of your need for instant gratification and Use your mind to shift the focus into delaying that gratification. So having long-term perspectives, focusing on a process, something that you find sufficiently enjoyable yet challenging so that you will get gradually better at it. That's uh, my best takeaway. Beautiful. And Borg, tell people where they can find you, what, wherever you want to send them as far as how they can follow your work or get in touch with you if they want to do your programs or work with you one-on-one, -on -one, let people know what, what services and programs you offer. Uh, Borgifarley.com, my homepage. Uh, I currently have a, a quite extensive course with like training, nutrition, mindset. I plan to shift my platform into more focusing on mindset uh, behind the scenes here. Uh, but, you know, that's my current uh, prior offer. I also do one-on-one -on -one coaching online. I have a YouTube channel where it's currently, you know, interviews with some muscle growth training experts, but it will gradually shift more into uh, mindset and psychology because that's my... Uh, my main interest and passion these days. Uh, you can also You're find tired of the forever wars of debating how many sets per workout is optimal with all the other fitness influencers. <laughs> exactly. That's kind of where I'm at right now, which is, <laughs> is probably very evident if you go to my Instagram yeah. and see my last few posts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Borg, it has been an absolute pleasure to reconnect with you. Uh, I, I, it's been way too long and uh, we need to do another one. Let's do another podcast talking more about mindset. I know you have a lot of thoughts on nutrition as well. We'll do two, three maybe podcasts. Uh, it's really a joy to reconnect with you. And I, I feel uh, a lot of gratitude in my heart for meeting you a decade ago and for you asking for a refund on my program and then engaging with me in discussion and then forming this this beautiful conversation that we had where where i learned i i hope you learned too but certainly i learned a lot uh from yeah. it and i think we I, I also got the refund just to make that clear <laughs> yeah yeah and um i i think it was it's a beautiful friendship that we've had all these years i've had a lot of love and gratitude in my heart for you even many through many years that we haven't even had any communication but uh, yeah. it's, it's a real joy to reconnect with you and let's do it again. Maybe next week we'll do part two. Yeah, likewise, Ari. I mean, it's, it's been a, an honor and, pleasure and and really great to reconnect. Likewise, brother. All right, talk to you soon. Yeah.